It is silent now. What is it? My sixth grade teacher asked the question, and a quizzical look filled his face. It is silent now. What is it? He didn't know. Time's up. You have to go to the end of the line. We were in a history bee, like a spelling bee, and everyone was lined up, and they'd ask the question. If you got the question right, you could stay in front. If you got the question wrong, you'd have to go to the back and do not pass go, do not collect $200. It is silent now. What is it? The next girl offered a timid answer. No, you're wrong. Go to the end of the line. It was getting closer to me, and I'd have to answer that awful question. It is silent now. What is it? The guns of World War II? Volunteered a young man. No, you have to go to the end of the line. It is silent now. What is it? The girl in front of me gave a wrong answer, and now it was up to me. The teacher looked at me and said, It is silent now. What is it? My eyes glassed over. (laughs) I opened my mouth to offer a guest, and... Ring! The school bell rang, and it was the end of the school day, and I was off the hook. (laughs) The teacher closed the class and said, we will resume tomorrow morning with the same question. Everybody remember your place in line? So I was off the hook just for a while. But I'd recently become a Christian and gotten born again. I didn't know what it all entailed. I didn't know that it meant that I had Holy Spirit and that God could help me and talk with me. I worried about the history of me all night. And I finally prayed and asked God for help and went to sleep. When I awoke the next morning, the answer was in my mind. I went to school, and the history bee resumed. It is silent now. What is it? The teacher asked. I said, the Liberty Bell? Right! And she grinned and went on with the history bee. Since then, I've received many answers in my waking thoughts. Later, when I was at Bible college, I became known as a Bible researcher. I'd learned how to use the basic reference books, the interlinear, Young's Concordance, and I just got an adeptness at being able to share the Word. So it developed, and now we have this class, working the word. And in this part of the class, I'd like to share on the biblical interpretation principles which we must consider. And this is the wisdom of over 30 years of Bible research. We must always understand a difficult verse in light of the clear verses on the topic. And that, is, that takes discipline. And it takes honesty. When you work the word and when you look at all the verses, many times you'll see one that might be difficult. So what do you do? Do you laud the difficult one to the detriment of all the other ones? Well, it seems, though, that there are a lot of Christian groups out today that that's how they differ from someone else (laughs) because of their interpretation of the difficult verse. But we need to look at all the verses in light of what they say and then try to understand the difficult verse in that light. Sometimes it's a mistranslation. Sometimes it's an oriental culture issue. Sometimes it's something else. And sometimes you you just don't know. I enjoy watching the History Channel and the Discovery Channel on television. That's what we watch most of the time. And, of course, you know, if you've ever seen, they have uh, shows on the Bible on there. And, of course, I don't know where they get some of their information from. (laughs) But I still watch them. I end up yelling at the television set sometimes. Where'd you get that? I wish somebody would have me do one of those. It would be fun, be able to get the word out there. But anyway, I still watch them. And, you know, I've had questions about certain verses that I didn't know, and I just set them aside. I didn't get bothered because, you know, we have so much that we do know. We have such a richness of the word that we can concentrate on. So I don't let it bother me. But every once in a while, while I'm watching those shows of all places, I get answers. Stuff I hadn't known for years. All of a sudden they say some comment and I say, wow! That's why! See, so you have to have an inquiring mind. You have to be hungry. You have to be willing to search and willing to look. 
Seek. And the Bible says, ask and you'll receive. Seek and you'll find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. But those words are in the present tense, meaning keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. You'll get there. You'll receive it. I mean, if life was, you just ask once, boom, there it was. It wouldn't be very meaningful, would it? But you have to have some discipline. But also, some things you might not realize your entire life. They'll be on that little box of questions. Well, that's honest. We're, we're not God. We don't know everything, right? right? I mean, we don't. So we have to understand our humanity. We have to be humble and understand that. Now, also, the interpretation and application of a concept must be always in respect to whom it is addressed. For example, there are three groups in the Bible that the Bible is addressed to, either the Jews or the Gentiles or the church. Sometimes people wonder why the Apostle Paul said what he said when Jesus said something slightly different. So they wonder, well, Jesus was speaking to whom? To the Jews in that fourth administration. Certain things had not yet been accomplished, right? Then afterwards, after the day of Pentecost, things changed. And so now the Apostle Paul speaks in terms of what's new in the church, and he speaks to the church. Now also, one other thing, though, we need to understand is that when the word is speaking to the church, there were two divisions of the church. There was a Gentile branch, and there was a Judean branch. The Gentile branch had Paul and Silas and Timothy as their leaders. The Jewish branch, or the Ebionite branch, had Peter, James, and John. And each group was highly affected by their background and their culture. So, for example, the Judean church, they had a real impediment because they had been taught the law for generations. Their whole society revolved around it. Now, can you change that just by waving your hand over it? No, you can't do that. It takes a while. So they were on a different track. They still would have ultimately ended up in the right place, but they had other things to deal with. You see, for example, like what we do at Christian Family Fellowship, if somebody asks us for help, if some other fellowship out there asks us for help, we just don't blow in there and tell them what to do. We ask them, how can we help you? Because the leader of that fellowship knows more about what their people need than we would. Doesn't that make sense? So we come in and we re we're a resource. That's why we ally with people and we share resources. No strings attached. So we let them grow the way that they need to grow. Well, the same was true with the Ebionite church and the Gentile church. So, for example, there's books of the Bible that are addressed, like 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sosthenes, our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So that's written to all Christians, both the Gentile branch and the Judean branch. Do you understand? Now, if you look at James chapter 1, here's a part with James, very interesting. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Then he says, my brethren. So, these were Judean believers that had gotten born again. So, this is like a little subset underneath that broad to the church. This has stuff in it that might be a little different than some of the other epistles. Well, they had to deal with this culture issue, and they had to grow up out of it. Now, later on, if you look at 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, in verse 15, here it says, An account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given to him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles speaking in them of those things in which are some things hard to be understood. Why? Because they had that other cultural issue to deal with, see. And which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures to their own destruction. So you see that Peter, who was one of the leaders for the Ebionite side, he endorsed what Paul said. So that's why I say, ultimately, they would have met up. Ultimately, 
they would have overcome whatever their difficulties were and they would have gotten common ground. Same thing with the Gentiles. The Gentiles didn't know anything about the Old Testament. They didn't know all of those wonderful things that were fulfilled in the New Testament. See, And also they had problems with their pagan gods. That's why Paul had to write to the Corinthians and tell them what to do in many areas because they were affected by their culture too. You understand? See, so we have to understand that the interpretation and application of a concept must be always in respect to to whom it is addressed. Now, if you have an apparent contradiction, that will be resolved many times by a better translation, better textual variant choice, or better understanding of Bible culture or idioms or figures of speech. Because you see, what we want to do, we know that the Word interprets itself. We want to get back to the place where we understand what was in the mind of the prophet when they wrote what they wrote. Now, of course, that was a totally different culture, totally different language, totally different philosophy, and thousands of years ago. And so things have changed between now and then, haven't they? Certainly. So it will take some effort. It'll take some work. That's why we need to be workmen of the Word. We just don't read the Bible, and then we believe what strikes our minds when we read was from God. Because it, it, it possibly could be, but also it could be from our own head, from our own culture. And there's a whole lot of things that we have backwards. We think we know what they are, but when, when we read the Bible, we, but we interpret them according to our culture and our philosophy when theirs was totally different. So you have to be a workman. And sometimes it takes time to clear up these misunderstandings. So you can't ever force things. You just have to take, sometimes it takes decades, see. You know, I believe the Bible was perfect when it was first written, so that gives us something to work towards. When you finally get the answer for a scripture, many times what it'll do is it'll ring throughout the rest of the word. It'll reverberate throughout the rest of the word. You'll get the answer, and all of a sudden you get three or four or five or six other verses, and all of a sudden, boom, 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 boom. Oh, that's the picture. So you get that reverberation, you get that concurrence, you get that confirmation. That's what makes me think it fits. See, It's not just because it fits my theology or it feels good or, or whatever. Another principle is if you choose an unexpected or unusual alternate word meaning or if you choose a textual variation, prove it! <laughs> okay, prove it. Justify the harder reading. Don't just say, well, I like this one because it fits my theology. That's what everybody else does. Now, if you want to be a good researcher, you've got to be honest. And you've got to let the word interpret itself. So in the class, and in, in the sessions we had, we saw how we can utilize contextual inference to choose the right meaning. See, you just don't choose it because it fits your theology. You let the context tell you which one it is. Then you can speak and teach with the authority of, thus saith the Lord. See, that's what we want. Also, sometimes we get new light. Sometimes we understand new stuff. Look at Acts chapter 17. And that's a real privilege when that happens. But, you know, you've got to be able to handle the responsibility. You've got to be able to handle it right, or God's not going to entrust you with anything else. And in Acts chapter 17, Paul was in Athens... In verse 16, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Look at his heart. He just wanted to help. He wanted to reach him. So what did he do? Well, he went to the marketplace and disputed with the philosophers and Epicureans and all those guys. The Athenians were really something because in, in verse 21, it says, For all the Athenians and strangers who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. You know, new things are fun. New things are neat. But they can't be our bread and butter because if we're constantly figuring out new things, well, what does that say about what we knew? <laughs> you know, there's two kinds of research. There's research and there's research. The research is the part that we need to major on. That's going back over what we think we know to make sure that we do know it. And many times we deepen our understanding, but also research is being able to apply it, not just know it, because just knowing it is not enough. 
If you just know it and don't do it, you know what the word says, you'll deceive yourself because it'll be just like that basketball on the shelf in the closet. There it is, it's up on the shelf. There's my basketball. It's round, it's brown. I know how to play it. Yes, I know. I know how to shoot. I know how to dribble. But you leave it up there in the shelf and you never do anything about it. There it is. I know the doctrine. I know it. I just know it. But then when you take down the basketball, finally, after two or three years and try to use it, what happens? Thud. Because the air has gone out of it. It has a form of basketball, but no power thereof. Okay? That's what the word says. So if you want to keep something, if you want to maintain something, you need to apply it. You need to do it. Then you'll understand it. Because it's not enough just to be able to parrot what somebody else said. Because if you can do that, you don't understand it. You really do understand it if you're able to help the gainsayers if you're able to help the opposers, if you really do know it, that parroting is not going to help those guys. It'll be when you speak it in your terms, and then when you adapt it to their question and answer their question with your terms. Do you understand? See? Because you know it. I've done it. See? That's where the real understanding is where you can use it, where you can help people with it, see. Otherwise, we think we know it, but we really don't, see. And that's why research is so important. Now, of course, occasionally, people go out into the unknown and do research, but that's not the norm. That's special. That's unusual. So if you understand this, then it will help you put things into better perspective. Because, you know, I have, uh, I've had my share of new stuff, okay? But I've also seen a lot of people who get one little thing, and they just get so excited about it, and it's so, it's wonderful, it's neat. You know, it's, it's God's working in you, and it's a wonderful thing to be a part of. But you have to handle the responsibility in a correct fashion. Don't go off the deep end. Don't get so excited you get things out of perspective. Keep things in balance, see? Because you know what? Even good things can be misapplied, right? Don't let your good be evil spoken of, right? For example, here you are and you're at a, a funeral and somebody says something about, well, so-and-so is up there looking down upon us. Well, do you teach them about the truth of the word, what it says in that category at that time? No, you don't do that. You understand what I'm saying? There's a time and a place for everything. And you have to have wisdom. And when it comes to this new stuff, you have to really make sure and do a checkup from your neck up, see? Because you have to check your motivations. You have to check everything to make sure that you're on the right path. And also, sometimes, you know, you just... I know we love the word so much we get into the details so much. We get out our concordance and we get out our books and we have a pile of books here, you know, and you look at this and you look at that and you just work the word and it's so much fun and, you know, you get into it. But sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees. You know, you see so many details, it's hard to take the step back and see the big picture. See, that's why I say we need to do macro and micro, see, we need to look at the details, and then we need to take a step back and look at the scope. So that's why just reading the Word is so wonderful. And get another version of the Bible and read it in another version. That's refreshing. That's exciting. That's fun. Or have a fellowship where you have 15, 20 different versions of the Bible, and you all go around the room, and you read a verse out of each one. Those are fun. Because one, one version of the Bible may really hit it, and then you'll understand another version Another verse will fit. And that's just great. But you see, you have to let the Spirit of God work. And sometimes you can teach things that are going to hurt people because you're not applying them right. Even though you're so excited, you think you're right. But you see, the best thing to do when you want to find out if it is right, look at the fruit. Okay? Look at the fruit. Think, how can I practically apply this? Because... Researchers usually have been thought of as explorers, you know, and they go off by themselves to discover something, 
and then they come back wearing a beard and a discovery. <laughs> All right? But see, we need to think of researchers as a part of the body, not a lone ranger. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. See, we are all part of a body, whether we know it or like it or not. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, For by one Spirit were we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. That's what happened when we got born again. We didn't have any choice in that. We're part of a body. We're part of something bigger than ourselves. It's bigger than just you or me. And, you know, the body is not one member, but many. It's many members. And so the foot cannot say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body just because it says that? No. And the ear can't say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? No. I mean, if the whole body were an eye, you know, and the eye people are like the research people, you know, we, we can see the word and all this other stuff. But you know what? If the whole body were an eye, that would be weird. That would be weird, wouldn't it? This big eye rolling down the road, you know? <laughs> you couldn't get anywhere. You couldn't do anything. You don't have any hands to do what you need to do with your hands. You don't have any feet to get, just a big eye. What good is that? without all the rest of the parts of the body. See, if the whole body were an ear, that would be eerie. Anyway, <laughs> what if it were the whole were smelling? All right, forget about that one. Anyway, but now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. God put the body together. And the eye cannot say that I don't need you. If they were all one member, verse 19, where would the body be? But see, now are they many members, yet one, but one body, and the eye, verse 21, cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Nor again the head to the feet, I don't need you. Nay, those parts of the body which we think to be more feeble are more necessary, and the members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, etc. See, we need parts of the body. We need each other. So therefore, that's why I say it is preferable to choose topics of study that are primarily driven by need rather than by mere curiosity. See, if you want to be a part of the body of Christ and function, then be a white corpuscle. Go to where the need is. Try to solve the need. Believe to solve the need. There you will get immediate results. You'll get to see God work. You'll get to see those signs and miracles and wonders. See, we just don't search the word for mere curiosity. Occasionally, that's great. It's great. It's wonderful. You can have a balance when it comes to things like that. But if you research the word, if you go to the word and try to solve needs, then you can get practical results to see if your stuff works. You understand? Because you could have the greatest thing. You could know how many angels can dance on the head of a pin or something. Well, what good? How do you apply that? It might be exciting. Well, how do you apply that? You look for stuff that's practical so you have something that you can work right away and see if what you have discovered works. Because you know what? If it doesn't work, it's probably not right. <laughs> <laughs> and you need to have the humility to acknowledge that. It's really tremendous just to see those who have gone before us in the character and heart that they had. You know, we, we learned about Tyndall, the Englishman who translated the Bible into English. And what did he do? Three days out of the work, uh, out of the week, he did not study the word. He didn't get his Hebrew books out and his Greek books out. You know what he did? He went through the streets of Antwerp and he found believers that had escaped from England because of the persecution and he ministered to them. He blessed them. Then on another day of the, of the week, he went into the poor people's area to try to help them. 
And then on another day of the week, he went to the rich people and he read the word to them before and after dinner. And I'm sure talked the word with them. And do you know what that did for him? It gave him the ability to take the lofty concepts in the Bible and put them into every man's English. And that is why his work is so wonderful because 85% of the King James Bible came from his work in the New Testament. Through all the committees, through all the versions, through all the other stuff, that 85% is still his words because he grounded his, himself in practicality. Like I say, he got his hands dirty. Okay, He waded in with his hip boots on. He helped people, and he saw what worked, and then he saw how to say it in terms they would understand. Uh, the same was true with the Spanish Bible. Uh, Valera did the same thing. He had a sailor's ministry and a prison outreach, even though he spoke ten languages. See, it kept him grounded. And that's why the Spanish version, the Reina Valera version of the Bible in Spanish, is just as lofty and beautiful in Spanish prose as the King James, which was a lot of Tyndale's work, is in English. Because they grounded themselves, see. And we stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before. We need to follow their example. So that's why I say pick subjects that are driven by need. Drive yourself to the practical application of what you're researching. It, if it's of no practical use, what good is it? Now, also... There's safety in a multitude of counselors, so seek the advice and follow the examples of those who are adept at researching God's Word. Would you go mountain climbing or spelunking by yourself? No. We need to tell people where we're going, so if we get lost, somebody will come find us. <laughs> and sometimes that happens with research. You know, if you go off by yourself and lock your sequester yourself in your ivory tower with all your books and all this other stuff, you might get lost. You might get lost. See, if you go to Deuteronomy 29, here, here's research right here. Verse 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. I'm sorry. They are his. And some things that are secret will still be secret, despite our best efforts. Now, Sometimes, like it says in the Gospels, Jesus said, it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to somebody else, just in parables. Why? If you look at the context, it talks about doing the word and applying the word, hearing to the end of applying and believing and being faithful. So, if you want to understand the mysteries of God, sometimes they'll only be understood by people who do not by people who study, not by people who just get into the books. But regardless of that, there may be some things you'll never figure out. They're God's. They're not yours. But what he does give us, what he does give us, it says, but the, those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children. So we have a responsibility to teach it to the next generation. And also, that we may do all the words of this law. What we know, we know so we can do something about it. Does that make sense? So if you keep those things in perspective, it'll help that you don't go off into never-never land. And we need to think in terms of our research as a community project, not just an individual thing. And also, you know, you need to get to know your equipment before you go out on the quest. I mean, if you're going to go spelunking or mountain climbing, maybe you might need to learn about all your equipment. Uh, you'll have to have opened your first aid kit to see what's inside it before you're out on the mountain and need it and open it and say, oh, no, it's not there, right? You need to know your stuff. So that's why we do research. We also do research. And you do the re part before you go out and search into the unknown. Do you understand? You prove yourself, you prove your tools, you learn how to work, and then you get those good habits that'll transfer when you do the launching out in the unknown. Acts 
17, 11. Your motivations are so important. It's just so important. In Acts 17, verse 11. Here the Apostle Paul was out there and he was teaching the Word. He got to Thessalonica and these were more noble, verse 11, than those in Thessalonica, that they received the Word with all readiness of mind. They were more noble. They were noble-minded. They had the right motivations. They were open to truth. But they didn't get top-heavy what did they do? They searched the word to see if those things were true. Do you understand? They spent the time to look and to see, and they did it daily. Look at 1 Corinthians 8.1. It's so important to understand what your motivations are. Roman, uh, 1 Corinthians 8.1, now it's touching things offered on the idol. We know we all have knowledge. Well, knowledge puffs up, but charity builds up. We need to be motivated by love, not by ambition, not by, I want to be smarter than everyone else, not by hunger for power, I want to be able to ride my light to the top and then tell everybody what to do. No! Gosh! What wrong motivations. You understand? See, we have to be able to honestly assess and do a checkup from the neck up and look for the attributes of puff upedness. <laughs> what are the attributes of this? The way that God works with me is the right way, and He needs to work with you the same way He works with me. Is that what happens sometimes? I mean, we get so excited. We can't see the forest for the trees. We get things out of perspective sometimes. And, and bless God, there's wonderful people out there that are so good at stuff. Well, praise God. Praise God they're so good at them. They're so wonderful. But you have to keep it in perspective because, you know, there's eye people and there's foot people and there's other kinds of people out there, not just the same kind as you. But the human tendency is to think, well, geez, I'm so good at this, other people ought to be like me. You know, and it, it, that's just a natural thing that happens. But don't let it get out of perspective. You have to realize, we're part of a body. And there's somebody else over there that's really good at something else. You know, I, I tell people, we all have the same amount of stuff. It's just stacked in different places. <laughs> no, what is the one body perspective of that? I will allow God to work in you the way he works in you because I need you. Another attribute of puff up is you need to do things my way. You know, a wonderful thing happened to me when I got married. I suddenly realized that here is another believer who does things the way that they think is right. And by gosh, it's different than what I think is right. Oh, it was a real wake-up call. <laughs> but you know what? They got things done. And I got things done. So we talked it over, and we said, okay, you do things that you help get things done your way, and I'll get things done my way, and we'll work together. And we'll get a lot more done than instead of just arguing about it and say, well, you need to do it this way. So the body says, let's work together. Let's focus on our common ground. See, the natural tendency is that if you excel at something, everybody else needs to do it. And if they don't do it, then something is wrong. But you see, we have abundance in many areas. Remember 2 Corinthians 8, I think it is, that lists all the kinds of abundance. abundance. Some people have an abundance in the Word. Some people have, they're just, they just open up their mouth and out comes the Word. And boy, when you need to hear the Word, you want to go to somebody like that, that's going to tell you the Word. They're not going to just tell you what you want to know. They're going to tell you the Word. And see, then there's people who are really good at knowledge. There's people who are really good at diligence. They get things done. There's people who are really good at Grace, believing for financial abundance. Boy, we need people like that because that helps move the word, you see? But there's other people who have an abundance of love or abundance of hope or an abundance of believing. We have all kinds of different kinds of abundance. So whatever your kind of abundance is, share it. Otherwise, we're not clones of each other, are we? That's not the body. 
If the whole body were an eye, where would everything else be? So the body says, you do your strength and I'll do mine. Also, that idea where, you know, you have to focus on your weaknesses and make them into strengths. Well, that's admirable, but what you look at, you become, right? If you want to get miserable, focus on your weaknesses. No, focus on your strength. Do what God has called you to do. Do your long suit. As God is working in you to do your long suit, that'll bring up the other stuff. That's how. So, viva la difference! <laughs> We're in a body. And couple that, viva la difference, with love. I love you. I've decided to love you. And there's nothing you can do to make me stop. That brings the body together, even though we have divergent parts. Praise God, you can do something better than me. I'm glad. And if I can do something better, then I want to teach it to someone so that they can do it better than me. I want to be the fanner of your flame so you can do it better than me. We don't focus on our weaknesses. Wow. See, Ephesians chapter 4, we want to fight. For the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Not unity at all costs, but unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Ephesians 4, 3. We endeavor, we work hard at it, to keep, to guard. It's precious. The unity of the spirit, it's very, it's very important. It's very precious. But you see, we don't do it at the expense of the body. We don't do it at the expense of each other. We do it in the bond of peace. What kind of peace? The peace that comes after I dominate you? That's not peace. What is peace? Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. And above all these things, put on that love of God. I love you. I've decided to do it. And I don't care what you do. I'm still going to love you. Which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Let that goal of peace be the ruling thing that makes your decisions, that guides your thoughts, that guides your plans and your actions. That's our goal. We want that rule of peace to rule. And it's not just in your heart, in your mind, it's in your heart. To the which also we're called in one what? Body. See, it's peace in the body. And be thankful, and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, so you apply it right. You don't misapply it. You don't speak out of turn. You don't uh, try to impose your, your new light on somebody else when they're not ready for it. You know, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord where we give out our love and our abundance and what God has given to us with the same freedom and grace that he's given it to us with. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. If Jesus wouldn't do it, don't you do it. <laughs> That's what that means, basically. Giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Walk in his steps. Do it like he would do. 1 Corinthians 14 talks about peace the kind of peace we want in the body. 1 Corinthians 14, and in verse 29, here it's talking about prophets, but all the other ministries model after this. 1 Corinthians 14, 29, let the prophets speak, two or three. Let the others judge. They're not back there thinking, yeah, he doesn't know what he's talking about. I ain't going to listen to him. You know, no, no. You actively be a part of things. If you have a long suit and somebody else is up there teaching, well, think actively. Do you know what happens when you do that? Fireworks. They kindle you. You kindle them. You just can't be sitting back there saying, well, I'll shut up and wait. I, I, I want to get my turn. I want to get my turn. No, 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 no. You want the fireworks. Let the others judge. Then, verse 30, if anything be revealed to another that sits by... Let the first hold his peace. Okay? So, you know, if you're, hot, if you're moving the word, if you're utilizing your ministry, and all of a sudden you see that somebody else who has a long suit in your area gets inspired, you know what you do? You defer. You give them some face time. You give them a chance to grow. Right? How are they going to grow unless they can apply what they've got? Right? 
You give them a chance to grow. Step aside for a moment. See, verse 31, for you may all prophesy one by one. You may all exercise your ministry one by one. You may all be a part of the body of Christ and grow so that all may learn and all may be comforted. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You know when it's time for you to shut up and let somebody else speak. When, it, when you're speaking in tongues and then you're going to interpret, right? You know when to stop speaking in tongues and start interpreting, right? And when the time comes that you finish the interpretation, you know when that end is there, don't you? Right? Or when you're ministering to someone and God's telling you what you need to minister to and all of a sudden he stops, you know that's the end, don't you? So when you're exercising your ministry and getting all highfalutin and God says, stop, let somebody else share, you know when that is. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, right? God is not the author of confusion, but of what? Peace. That's the kind of peace we want where all participate in harmony. We want the peace that comes through the harmony of the body. That's something. So when it gets back to research, your new light, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. It's so exciting, but don't let it get you out of balance. Especially if, you know, it's different. If, if it's different, you better be careful because you have fire in your hands. And you might be wrong. You might be. So if we think in terms of the one body, are you going to set the one body on fire? No, I'd rather kindle it a different way, okay? Uh, so what do you do? Well, again, you check your motivations. See, I have seen so many wonderful, capable, wonderful people get tripped up by this one thing. First time God gives them some light, okay? Some new thing, whatever. If you handle it correctly, then God will give you more. He'll be able to trust you with more. But what's your motivation? What's your motivation? Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 12. I just hate to see that happen to anyone that's a great, beautiful, wonderful believer, and they get off the deep end and out of perspective. And Man, it just hurts. They're part of me. They're part of the body. I need them. Philippians chapter 1, and in verse 12, but I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which have happened to me have fallen out rather to the furtherest of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and all other places. So here was Paul, he was jailed. Now there's a negative situation. So what are you going to do about it? Well, and many of the brethren growing bold by my bonds, so there was an opportunity, there was a vacuum in the body, some leadership needed to be filled in, so people were bold. But what emboldened them? Some indeed preached Christ even of envy and strife. So you have to watch your motivations. Envy, you want what somebody else has. Well, you don't need to do that. You already have a wonderful part in the body that God created in you as a masterpiece. You don't need to emulate somebody else and be, be envious of them. You can be a beautiful masterpiece yourself if you just do your long suit. You can be part of the body and do wonderful things. You don't need envy. You don't need strife. Strife is, I want that position at all costs, and I'll do anything, even unethical things, to get there. I mean, just look at the political landscape today. You, <laughs> you have a panorama of what it's like. Those guys out there are poster children for strife. Oh, man. I mean... Consider Ananias and Sapphira. Look at Acts chapter 5, verse 13. Acts chapter 5, verse 13. God does not like strive. It says, and of the rest durst no man join himself to them. What was happening? Ananias and Sapphira tried to thrust themselves into the inner leadership circle. And just think what would have happened had they gotten there with the motivations that they had. What kind of destruction would they have caused? See, that's why that whole thing happened. See? So don't try to ride your light to the tops. You know, what kind of motivation do you have? We need to have the proper motivation. If you go back to Philippians, it says one preached the Christ of envy and strife, but the other of goodwill. And that's it. Goodwill. It means kind intent. In other words, proper intent, proper motivation. That's the word eudokia. 
Eudokeo means to be well pleased. That's related. Well, whose pleasure do we want? God's. That's right. And like it said in 1 Corinthians 12, he placed it in the, us in the body as it has pleased him. So the proper motivation when there is a need is to be motivated by one body type of motivation. To be at the right place at the right time to serve God and to please God. See, Psalm 103 and in verse 21. Bless ye the Lord, all his hosts, ye ministers of his, that do what? His good pleasure. That's how you get to be a minister of his. If you do his good pleasure, then God will put you in the body where you need to belong. See, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it's God which is working in you to will and to do of what? His good pleasure to put you into the right place in the, part, in the body where you belong. See, you let him work in you. Ha. Huh. <laughs> First, Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 12, verse 11 actually. Wherefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness. What does that mean? That you get to your place in the body where you're supposed to be. You fulfill it. His good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith which, with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be what? Glorified. How does it get glorified? How does it get glorified? Romans 15. We want the glory. Don't you want the glory? Don't you want to see God glorified? Verse 5, now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. Why? That you may with one mind and one mouth, what? Glorify God. That's how we get it. Do you want God glorified? Do you want God glorified? Then endeavor for the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Work together in the body. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 5, having predestinated us in the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. He gave us sonship. Just to give us sonship? No, we had a goal. The good pleasure of his will. That we would walk and please him and he would be able to set us in the body where we belong. Then when we got there, we would be to the praise of the glory of his grace. The praise related to the glory of his grace, where when we got there and we got that glory for God, we praise it. We say, wow, this is great. But it's the glory of his grace that he graced us with. That grace that was given to you, the grace that was given to me, your ministry. You see how that works? Wow. Wow. Huh. So, you know, you have new light. Well, that's wonderful. But if you compare it with all the rest of the stuff that we know, it's just a little peep. It's just a little peep. And I have seen so many people get into their peep that they forget about everything else. How much more do we know? And compared with that, all that, you know, this little sliver of light is just a little peep. I call them the apostle of the peep. Okay. Because here, you know, here are genuine leaders and teachers and everything, and we're gravitating to where the need is. We're reading the white corpuscles in the body of Christ, and we're teaching where people have need, and we're solving problems, and all they're doing is peep, peep, peep. You know, when it came to the Gentiles being born again, all right, that was a big change in the church, all right? Who finally got the Gentiles born again? Peter. Who knew first? Paul. Acts 26. On the road to Damascus. Way back then, he saw Jesus, who said to him, verse 16, Rise, stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for a purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of these things which you have seen, and of those things in which I will appear to you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send you to open there the Gentiles' eyes 
and to turn them, the Gentiles, from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they, the Gentiles, may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. And Paul said, no, no, it can't be. Gentiles? Who knew first? Paul. What did he do about it? Galatians chapter 1. If you have new light, do what Paul did. Verse 15, but when it pleased God, now you know why that word is there, right? Who separated me from my mother's womb and called me to his grace. Not just the grace of getting born again, but the grace of his ministry that God gave it to him by grace. To reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, the heathen. When he learned that, what did he do? Did he teach it? Did he set the church on fire? Did he try to change things from the ground up? Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. Conferred, pros ana tithemi. To put one's self upon another with the purpose of conferring with them. He didn't take his new light and unload it on somebody else. What did he do? Verse 17, Neither when I went up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. He worked it. He tried to make sure it was right. Then after three years, <clears throat> I went up to Jerusalem, and who did he see? Peter. And abode with him 15 days, and the other apostles I didn't, I didn't even talk to, except James, the Lord's brother. So Peter and James were the top, were the, were the established leaders. He took it to them. Don't teach your peep. Don't confer with flesh and blood. Take it to the established leaders. Don't cause division. God hates division. You know, he is a wise master builder, built the church. He placed people in the body as it has pleased him. That takes a lot of heart. That takes a lot of effort, right? So don't destroy that by division. Like it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, what's going to happen? It'll just be burned. It'll go for nothing. So why do it? When it's the right time, then who's going to initiate this? Who did it in Acts chapter 10? Peter did. And God gave him threefold revelation that he just couldn't get out of. He just couldn't get out of. And the men were there, and God said, go with them. So then, here in Acts chapter 10, and in verse 34, Peter's standing there. Cornelius told him about the angel and said, they said to tell me to tell you to tell me what to do. <laughs> and Peter, in Acts chapter 10, in verse 34, he opened up his mouth. That means he let him have it. That means he was full of something to say because all this came together and, oh man, Paul told me about this stuff. Click, 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 verse, verse, verse. Whole panoramic picture comes together and Peter says, of a truth, I see that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he, he that reverences him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And a whole wave of healing went all over Cornelius and his household. It just impacted them. Later on, they spoke in tongues, and nobody told them to do it. Why? Because they put two and two together, and it just, they were just so inspired and so healed. That's why that incident happened. But where did the truth come from? It came through the established leaders. Now, of course, God honors the body that he set up. He honors the leadership structure. Structure, oh no, oh no. I was hurt by structure, oh no. Not too much structure. You know, it's not like, what is your full body designation? I'm five of nine of the tertiary adjunct of the Unimatrix One, for you Borg fans. No, it's not hyperstructure. It's not resistance is futile. Because then so is inspiration. No, you add your distinctiveness to the body freely. The structure is just enough to make things work. It's just enough to build, but we let God build it, see? We let God build it, just like 
you are really good at what you do and I'm really good at what I do and we work together and we work together and as that whole chemistry of the fellowship works, people will rise up because what God gives them and as they rise up they bless people and people unify and array themselves around those functioning pivotal ministers because of what God gives them. That's how God sets leaders in the church. See? And he worked really hard at that. So if you get new light, work through the proper channels, and God will give you more. Sometimes you need to put a topic aside for six, eight months, because you have it out of perspective. Be honest enough to do that. Come back to it. Always a check, the, check the opposing viewpoints, because that's just honest. So what is our goal? There are many discoveries yet to be made. There are many things we only know in part, we prophesy in part. What is our goal? He that knows the most, the most when he dies wins? No. Our goal is to bless the believers, to have them grow, like it says in Colossians chapter 1, the great goal that we all have as a body working together. In verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man, that's admonishing every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Look at that. Every man. Every man. Every man. No one gets missed. Not the weird guy in your fellowship that... No one gets missed. We don't play favorites. Just like in any family. You have kids in your family, and some kids are this way, and some kids are that way. Well, because they're that way, are they not your kids? No, you love them. They're the best. You know the potential that's there, so you just work. You just work. Verse 29, Whereunto I labor, striving according to his working, which works in me, how? mightily. See, that's our goal. We want to present every man perfect, mature in Christ Jesus. So whatever it takes, that's a practical thing. That's a heart thing, right? So we're driven by that need, not by the desire to know everything. We're driven by the goal, like it says in Ephesians 4, 11, verse 11, he gave some Apostles and prophets, evangelists and some pastors and teachers, why are they here? And the rest of the ministries follow the same lead. For the perfecting of the saints, katartizo, having been thoroughly furnished for everything they need. Heavy duty, all purpose, under all conditions, to be able to succeed. For the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And how long are we going to do this? Till we all, till we all, every man, every man, every man. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man, unto the measure of the maturity of the pleroma of Christ. That's our goal. But what does it take to get there? Just knowledge? Absolutely not. It's heart. It's working. It's building people's hearts. It's being like those construction people that put together the chimney and you fit the rocks just perfect. That's everyone. We fit together in the body just where we're perfect, where we shine, fit together, fitly furnished. Why? Verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things who is the head of the class, Jesus Christ, our head of the body. That's our goal. Not knowledge for knowledge's sake. Not being puffed up, but being full of love, being full of love and giving. So, where do we go now in this class? With, with this information that we have, you know, Wayne laid a foundation in the 
foundational class on this, and I'm just trying to build on it. And there's much more. I mean, we could have spent a whole session on structure. We could have spent a whole session on a number of things. Sometime in the future, I'm opening it up to have other people help in doing a part two of this. And then we can publish it later on with the syllabus and stuff. Because I'm sure there's, there's wonderful knowledge to be had. And of course, I'm looking forward to doing a Greek class sometime. And see, then we can get into other things like the Greek prepositions and the tenses and the cases. But that's, that's a little bit more advanced than what you would have in a foundational class on working the word. But there's enough here in what we've taught so far that it will give people a good, solid basis. So what do we do now? Get busy. Spudazon. Spudazon. S-P-O-U-D-A-Z-O-N. Spudazon. And that's um, aorist imperative. That means get it done yesterday. <laughs> okay, that's that kind of command. One time, right now, already done. Spudazon. Get busy. Now, I mean... Don't go out and spend $1,000 on a library you can't use. You're not measured by how many books are on your shelf. <laughs> and see, for people who have... Now, if you know how to use them, then I think that's a wonderful measure. measure. <laughs> but if they're just sitting there being a dust-covered stuff on a bookshelf, no, that's not our motivation. Get an interlinear and get a concordance and get busy. If you don't have one... I really encourage at least every family to have a concordance and an interlinear. Uh, I don't mind if you have a Young's or a Strong's. I prefer the Young's because I've used it more. But there are people who have used the Strong's that are used to it, and they like it as well. But get yourself a concordance and use it. Get yourself a, an interlinear and get busy. And then get out there and help people. If you really want to learn, do you know where the learning is? In the Ministry of Reconciliation. That's where the need is. And you'll, you'll need the Word. You'll need to recharge your batteries. But if you've got something hot, then hold it forth. Just like Paul, he was engrossed in the Word. He was infected with it. <laughs> right? Well, what kind of a case do you have? Just get an interlinear and a concordance and get busy. Don't take my word for it when you hear teaching or John or Wayne or any one of our other wonderful teachers or your fellowship teacher or whatever. Don't just take their word for it. Make it your own. Make it your own. Check it out. Make sure they're right. Don't hitchhike on somebody else's faith because that doesn't work, does it? No. No. Get your basketball down and work with it <laughs> so you can shoot the shot. And now, for some of you who have a hunger or an aptitude for language, well, why not consider taking a Greek or a Hebrew class? Or if you're fortunate enough to be near an institution that teaches Aramaic or Syriac, consider that. Why not? You could audit the class. So... If you have an aptitude and a hunger for some of these languages and want to take it the next step, well, take a Greek class at a local seminary or at a university or college. Or if none of those are available to you, maybe do a home study. Get one of those courses in a Bible bookstore. But always maintain the correct attitude, no matter how much you know. Be meek, be teachable, be coachable. See, keep that in balance. Study, get busy so that we can know that we know, so we can apply the word and not just for knowledge's sake. Get busy applying it. Kainun, spudazan. Bless you.